Right now, we're going to be moving into a facilitated session about the Open Government Partnership. Um, and that's the reason why we've got you in these little pods in your seats. And I'm going to introduce Suzanne and Michael now, who are going to explain. Please. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to the left. And okay. I'm going to do it all. Good afternoon, everybody. Kia ora. Hey, thank you very much there. Thank you. I always like that pantomime effect. Uh, lovely to see everybody. I'm very sorry. I'm Michael McCauley. I, I haven't been able to attend this fantastic conference. If anyone wants to tweet me, by the way, uh, I'll get this out of the way now. It's at Mick McCauley. At Mick McCauley, all one word. If you're going to be abusive, please just realize you're at the back of a very, very long queue. Uh, I haven't been able to be here, and I find that a huge shame, because even in the hour and a half, I've managed to have a little look around. Uh, what I've seen is absolutely fantastic. And th there's something, I think, that unites just about everything I've seen. I've, I've seen people using smartphones, various forms of technology. Uh, Alana just facilitated a little session there. But I've seen post-it notes. Uh, I've seen posters. I've seen pen and paper. Uh, and what I've really seen is one fundamental truth that I'm sure you're already aware of. Ideas, my friends, cannot be contained. And it doesn't really matter how we express them. The important thing is, is how you express, it's not how you express them, it's that they get expressed. Uh, and so we'll be really grateful today to, to draw on your brains and draw on your ideas and draw on your creativity again to discuss the Open Government Partnership. Has anybody heard of the Open, Go Open Government Partnership? I see hands. <laughs> this is borderline miraculous. Uh, fantastic, that's absolutely wonderful. The vast majority of people haven't. That doesn't necessarily surprise me. But the Open Government Partnership is something that's been around since 2011. Uh, originally, eight countries were signed up to the OGP. New Zealand signed up uh, last year, and there are now over 60 countries that are all signed up to it. Uh, and usually, uh, as an academic, and actually just as a human being, I'm quite skeptical of these kind of things, because we can all talk about open government, and then we can always still find that there seems to be a lot of secrets all over the place. But I'll be honest with you, uh, I was in Bali last year. Uh, I was at the first Asia Regional uh, Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Summit. Uh, and there was a lot of people there from Cambodia and from Thailand and Vietnam and Laos and just about everywhere else. And they've all taken OGP to their hearts. And some of the things that people have been doing in their countries is absolutely phenomenal uh, and actually quite inspirational. And it was brilliant to see that OGP seems to be having such a very positive impact. And why I think hopefully it will be of interest to you guys today is because it is very much broadly in the open transparency space. Can I have the next slide? Marvellous. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing I want to stress, though, is that open government doesn't just mean open data. Uh, as you can see here, the Open Government Partnership is a very ambitious collection of ideas, uh, very, very, very broad, very loosely connected, as they should be, because you know, we need to operate in spaces where people can be fluid and where people can be dynamic and people can move between discrete ideas and discrete silos uh, in order to try and find solutions uh, across different ideas and working and collaborating with a huge range of people. The OGP is underpinned by something called the five grand challenges. And as you can see, they're up there. They are broadly speaking to improve public services. You know, what doesn't that cover? To improve public integrity, to more effectively manage public resources, to create safer communities and to increase corporate hospitality. But it's accountability, accountability. But uh, these are actually underpinned by four values that you can see in the circles there. And those four circles say transparency, accountability, citizen participation, and technology and innovation. And really, what lies at the heart of the OGP is the idea of participation through innovation. That really is where all the fantastic ideas that I bore witness to uh, last year uh, and subsequently have all seemed to lay. It's all about how people, anyone, can join in the discussion, how anybody can be aware uh, that their voice can be heard and hopefully will be heard. Now, obviously, this is going to necessitate uh, quite a long uh, and hopefully iterative program. New Zealand has its own action plan. It, signed, it uh, produced an action plan last year. Uh, I'll go through it very briefly in a second. And that action plan is already going to be uh, in line to be assessed in September. So there's going to be a, a very broad public consultation coming up in the next few months, which everyone will be able to join in. But hopefully, 
the discussion that we're going to have among ourselves this afternoon will feed this in as well. We'll feed this in. And we're, we're starting with a blank slate this afternoon. We're starting with an empty page just to see how people feel about these grand challenges and how really you can use all the ideas uh, and to finesse those ideas as you have done for the last two days into something tangible that we can put to a very broad range of goods for the, for the whole of New Zealand, to be brutally honest with you. The role of civil society is absolutely crucial. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And if you can see the, uh, the action plan, he works his time. There are four basic elements to it. The first is to look at better public services. I hope a lot of people here have heard of the Better Public Services Initiative that's been running in New Zealand for the last few years now. Uh, it's actually a very innovative, uh, innovative program in itself. Uh, and in particular, there is a, the, the action plan is looking at uh, the number 10 on build, uh, better public services, where New Zealanders can easily complete their transactions with the government in a digital environment. There is also uh, a, a great store placed on the ICT strategy and action plan, and particularly the idea that New Zealand government will be open by default. There is also a great store placed on the Kia Tutahi relationship accord. Uh, I hope you've heard of that. Uh, if you haven't, that goes to show why these things need to be more open and more transparent. That's something that was originally established in 2011 uh, and allows communities, voluntary organizations, the charity sector to again really try and engage in government policy making. And that's going to be looked at again and look at those relationships and to see a, if they're working well enough, but B, how they can be improved, how collaborations can be spread even further and embedded even deeper. And then finally, I'll let Suzanne talk about this later. The final part of the action plan is to respond to Transparency International's National Integrity System study from 2013. But there's a number of key questions that we want you to broadly look at and think about uh, in the next few minutes. Firstly, uh, whether or not you know all of the action plan or you recognize bits of it, or perhaps maybe this is the first you've heard of it at all. Does, do you think it goes far enough? What is the pathway that we should all be engaged on in terms of open government work? How do we get to say what channels should be used? How will technology really help to facilitate broader discussions throughout the country? What will the participatory infrastructure be, as I've written it up there? Do you want to be involved? How would you like to be involved? How do you think you could have incentives to be involved? How should you be involved? What role should you have? What forms of engagement would you welcome? And of course, categorically, maybe not in the next few weeks, but certainly in the years to come, what is it that you actually want to be consulted about? Where will your expertise and interests coalesce with everything in terms of public policy, public management, and the political lives that we live? So, I'll turn you over now, if I may, to the facilitators uh, who are going to explain the next part of the process. Uh, and I look forward to talking with you again in a few minutes where we're going to debrief some of the ideas that you have. So one of the things I think some of you kind of raised is, well, you know, if these strategies are already there, how can we have an influence in the current environment? And one of the ways is, as you see, part of today, we had Lumio up there. And there's a Lumio um, discussion now that you can all participate in, ask to join in, the NAP OGP Lumio discussion. And we have got several people here from within government who are part of the development of the National Action Plan. And I'm sure they will now tune into Lumio themselves. So that's a starting point. But I'd like also to, um, to talk about um, I, when I went back to Transparency International in Berlin and told them that we were doing this today, that the whole point of this was to actually start getting a genuine grassroots discussion going among this demographic. They said to me, well, yes, Suzanne, that's really great. Um, but what about the rest of the population? And I said, well, the amazing thing about this demographic is that you guys don't just talk to each other. You've actually got networks and pathways, which means that going away from here today, you can use those same networks and pathways, those same digital tools, to get the rest of the country involved in this conversation. Because the whole point of these action plans is that they're grassroots led, that, they're being, that the people's voice is being heard. No, absolutely. I think uh, I was talking, where are you? I was talking to our next speaker, talking to Michelle. And I was saying again, like I said to you guys, just how nice it was to hear such vivid conversations at this time of day, at the end of what is a big, hefty two-day schedule. And Michelle made the excellent point 
that when people are allowed to participate at the will. And hopefully, you know, we can reflect this on a much bigger scale and on a much broader scale as well in the years to come. Do you want to mention your TI stuff? Yeah, I think um, we're ready to wrap up this session so that Michelle can um, talk and we don't want to hold you too far away from your party. Um, all of you were given a handout um, uh, from Transparency International. It shows you that New Zealand is number one. Um, and um, and uh, we're number two, actually. We've been number one many years. We're number two now. Uh, and also, um, number one is Denmark. Number two is, and number two is New Zealand, and we're just one point behind. So we're in a, a unique group. If you look at your, if your map, we're in a u unique group of yellow zone countries. Um, and you see, we're not a very big group, the yellow zone countries. This is the most amazing thing that we have here, um, amazing legacy. So whatever you think about the existing system and the fact that it needs to communicate better, do be proud of the legacy that you've got at the moment, which is that um, we observe most international anti-corruption conventions um, and we basically have good governance and transparency of a high level compared to other countries. So you all know the faults of it and how it could be better, but frankly, compared to other countries, we're pretty good at the moment. And we need to keep it as good as it is. Um, and in this regard, um, as well as the Corruptions Perception Index, which is the basis for that map, the heat map, um, we conducted uh, in 2013 the National Integrity Systems Assessment, where we looked very, very closely at all of New Zealand's institutions. And out of that assessment, which is on the website, uh, it's called NIS on the, on the Transparency New Zealand website, um, what, what came out of it was that our biggest problem in New Zealand is complacency. The other thing that came out of it is in chapter six, you'll find that there's something like 100 different recommendations. Now, one of the recommendations, number two, was that, that we sign up to the Open Government Partnership and we do a quality national action plan. In turn, the State Services Commission adopted our recommendation and said that it would address all of the recommendations in our National Integrity Systems Assessment. So that's a starting point. But again, that's all been done centrally with a central group of people, mainly within the Beltway. We need to extend that wider. And why do we want to do this? Because when you've got strong integrity systems, you also have advantages. For example, with the sort of ideas that you've got and the products that come out of your digital technology systems, all of those things, you have an opportunity for greater market access because people trust New Zealanders. They trust doing business with us and they want to do business with us. Just about every country in the world says they would like to have a place like New Zealand and so they want to see you and hear you. And we need to use that opportunity so that we can actually make a difference in the future. So please continue to um, uh, participate in the, in the uh, National Action Plan. Please take away today, I know it was too fast, it was speed dating, take it away today, keep it going. And by the way, on the back of the form, you can join for free because we'd love to keep hearing from you at Transparency International New Zealand as well. Thanks very much for today. <laughs>